Which I am going to go here. I'm going to try that. Um, I might take the clicker. Perfect. All right, well, thank you so much for that introduction. Thank you for um, um, Jumpy Rivers for organizing this. And I have been to a couple of these Saturday conferences, and I, what I love about them is the variety of people in the community you get to hear from. And so I'm really happy to be here participating in a Saturday conference. I am. Um, hoping that together we can ask this question, um, what, what is production? What, what does this mean? As people who work with R, I bet you have heard um, R is no good for production or to, or to have experience that um, uh, maybe, maybe there's a lack of production knowledge or experience in our community and that um, people think we can't. And so what we're going to talk about is um, is, is asking and answering this question and talking about um, what ML Ops is. So I want to tell you a little about, about me and who I am and the perspective that I come from so that you can kind of understand the, um, the perspective that I bring to asking and answering these kind of questions. So my, my academic background is physics and astronomy, kind of like moved around in my, um, uh, in my career, and eventually landed in data science. Uh, I worked as a data scientist, like in tech, um, in some organizations, and then um, now, now I work on open source software full time for my job. So, um, if you think about that path, probably you think like one thing I want to notice or highlight is that I spent a lot of th that time writing code, but I was always writing code. Um, uh, to answer a question or to um, ask a scientific question, to do a scientific analysis. And I, I, I like many of you, I don't have formal, a formal like computer science degree. Like that's not my background and my training. And so like this is who I am. And if we talk about like who you all are in this room, I bet a lot of you have titles like data scientists. I bet a lot of you are statisticians by background. Uh, maybe some of you are data analysts. You have, um, you, you write code, but you probably don't primarily think of yourself as a software developer. You probably primarily think of yourself as having one of these other data-centric kind of roles. So today, as of today, my title is actually software engineer, and there might be people here also who have, like you have a more software developer, research software engineer, or you know regular software engineer. You might have a title like that. But a lot of us who, um, who are here because we like to use R for our data, practice, um, we, we probably primarily think of our identity from the data po point of view, and maybe less so from the software engineer point of view. So what that means is that you are probably someone who um, has developed a model at point at some point, right? Like you, you, um, you know how to you know use code to um, do exploratory data analysis, how to make plots. You know how to use code to um, probably you have trained a model at some point. And what I want to have the if you have a one big takeaway from this, it's that if you are someone who has developed a model, then you can be the person to, let's say, operationalize that model. So we'll talk a little bit more about what that means. What does it mean? What is like, does it mean to put something in production? Like what actually do we tech like very concretely mean when we talk about deploying a model? The other thing that I want to make, like call out and really communicate, is that if you are someone who knows how to develop a model, if you are someone who in your org ever builds, trains, develop model, then you are the right person to do the operationalizing of that model. So if you have spent time with EDA for that data, if you have chosen which kind of model to use, you've spent time um, tuning, evaluating that model, then you are the one that has the context, the domain expertise in the data and in the model. You know um, caveats about that model. You know what makes it more or less appropriate in different situations. And if you, if you 
have a some kind of dynamic in a company where one person trains the models and then we kind of kick it over a wall to someone else. Maybe it gets rewritten in another language or something like that. What that does is that leads to inappropriate use of modeling predictions. And if you, as someone who is a model developer, a model practitioner, can gain these these tools to go in your toolkit, then we, we move towards more reliable, more appropriately used, and fairer use of models in this way. So we're going to look at a few, um, uh, like a concrete example through a couple of this, just to have something to kind of have in our head. So the data set is um, a housing, a house pricing data set. And we have their, their houses in Seattle in the US. We have a price that the house sold at, information about the house, like the number of beds and the number, or the number of bedrooms, the number of bathrooms, how big it is, when the house was built. There's also a date of the sale. You can see it's a, it's not, it's a little bit of an older data set at this point. I don't think you can buy anything in Seattle for these prices anymore. <laughs> but it, it gives us something to kind of look at and be concrete when we talk about this process. So you've got this data. Picture yourself starting with it. You start on the process of exploratory data analysis. Then you start on the process of building a model. And this would be what you have as output. So this uses tidy models right here. But you know you may use some other modeling framework in R. Maybe you're someone who likes to do EDA and R and then build a model in Python, maybe. But anyway, think about you have a model, a trained, fitted model that you feel good about and is ready to go. Is your job done? In which, case, in which cases is your job done and is it not? So models, I think, um, in my experience, most of the time when you get to this point right here where the model is trained, um, there are maybe two sort of like a forking path kind of at this point of what you do next. You might um, what, need to communicate about the model. So say you, you train a model and you learn something that you will tell people about the model. So maybe you write a report. Maybe you, um, um, you, you, you take what you learn and it's used for making some different kind of decision. So that's sort of the communication path. And, and that's the point. The whole point of you training the model was to learn something so you could tell people. The other sort of path is that the reason you trained the model was so that you could um, generate predictions on new data. So we're going to have a new house um, in Seattle with a certain number of bedrooms and bathrooms. And I need to be able to predict the price, predict the price for the new house that comes, that comes in. So here, if that is the goal, if that is the purpose, like why did you train the model, um, let's, let's say that the main purpose there is predictive. And there, the, you are not done. You are not done when you get to this point. And instead, it is time to think about how to put that model into production, how to deploy that model. So we, so we, we say, okay, I, I built this model for predictive purposes. I need to, um, I need to do something ML opsy. Um, what, what is it that I do? Um, like, let's talk about what, like, what do people mean when they say ML ops? Maybe, maybe you hear people talking about ML ops. Maybe you go on LinkedIn and you, you know, you see a lot of things about ML ops. You know, maybe mixed in with the chat GPT stuff right now or whatever, and you say, OK, like, what is, what is MLOps? Is MLOps this? Like, this is, a, this is like this sea of tools and startups that say they will do MLOps for you for money, and it's just overwhelming, right? Like, like is this what MLOps is? Is MLOps a, um, uh, like a, like a, just a word that is full of hype and does not mean anything? Um, I, I, don't, I, I really don't like things that are not very well defined or like full of hype. So I'm going to say no, that is not what MLOps is. And instead, let's write out a definition of MLOps that we can have in mind as a working kind of definition here. So MLOps is a set of practices to deploy and maintain machine learning models in production reliably and efficiently. So MLOps is not about any specific tool, including the tool that I'm going to talk to you about today that I've been working on. It's not about like one specific tool. In, in fact, MLOps is about what are the, um, 
what are the sets of practices that we use when we, when we have a model and we need to you know, go down that path, not the communication path, but rather the, um, the deployment path, the production path with it? What do we do so that that goes well and we can be, have confidence in it? So um, let's do a different kind of visual for this process and think about like a model a life cycle, if you will, or like a cycle of modeling. So we start by collecting data there at the top. And I, you know, I've kind of said this already before, but like the first thing we do after we collect the data is we, we um, do exploratory data analysis. We understand the data. We prepare the data for the modeling process. And here there are, um, there are Great tools, you know, I bet a lot of us in here, since we're largely our users, like to use the tidyverse for this. Maybe you like to use data.table. There are tools, there are tools for the same kinds of tasks that are available in Python. Notice that these tools are um, open source tools that are widely adopted. And you know, you, there may be some differences of opinion about what the best tool exactly is to use, but all of these tools are have robust user bases, books about them. And the same is largely true when we go, when it's time to train and evaluate a model, whether you use something like tidy models or carrot, or maybe you build your models in Python perhaps. Um, again, there's, there's um, robust open source tools that you can read whole books about. So on the, on the um, Yes, okay, it's, uh, clearly it's the same direction as what I'm looking at. Okay, on the right side, on the right side of this, there are, you as a data scientist or a modeling practitioner have a tool, have options of tools that you probably love, you're probably familiar with, they feel comfortable to you. This becomes much less true when we get over on the left side of this cycle. In, it might, you know, people might even not be sure, like not be sure what are the tasks that go on this left side of this cycle. Um, so I've been working on a, um, a new-ish project called Vetiver, and Vetiver sits over on the left side of this cycle where you have a trained model already. You trained your model in the way you thought best, you decided was best. You have a trained model. You use the tools that you are comfortable with and that you love. And now it is time for us to walk you through these, these um, next parts, these next tasks. And over here, this is what we're talking about as the um, MLOps set of tasks that we need to do. So we'll, deal, we'll dig into this just a smidge more. But we need to version our model. We need to deploy our model. And we need to monitor the model that we have. So if you are, um, you may see this word vetiver, and some of you may think, wait, I feel like I've seen that word somewhere. Um, so vetiver is a, um, it's also known as the oil of tranquility, and it is, it is a thing that is used in um, very fancy candles and perfumery. Like it's a, it's a plant, but it is a, it's like a very good smelling plant. And it's actually used as a stabilizing ingredient in things like, perfume and candles. And so what it what the metaphor here, right, is that these volatile fragrances that are important and people love, like these are your models, right? And they're like, you know, they're volatile and like how do I how do I make sure it is what I what it needs to do? And vetiver is a stabilizing um, ingredient that helps you feel tranquil about your 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 deployed models there. So this is what the this is what the metaphor is. I'm going to show you our code for how to do this. So let's think back to that model that we had um, of predicting prices for housing. So the, what we're doing here is we're creating a, a, a deployable model object. When we create this at, at the, say, at the end of a modeling um, like, like process or procedure or workflow, we can capture a lot of information that turns out to be very important later. So what this deployable model object um, has in it, you can see some of it that gets printed, printed out here. We, um, I don't have to tell, I don't have to tell my, um, my model cr bundle creation process any of this because when we, at the time of model training, we have a lot of information about that model. We know 
you know, that in this particular case, we use Ranger. We're, we're predicting a numeric value. It's a regression. We know the, like the, the number of features, the names of features. And we can capture all of that and store it as metadata on the model. And Vetiver is specifically designed to have metadata that supports you or protects you, I guess, against like common failure modes when it comes to deployed models. This is all found pretty automatically. Like the, because it turns out when you are in the process of training the model, you have all this information. We just need a little bit of support in getting that recorded in a way that is useful. So a really sort of underlying um, goal or design, a design goal, I guess, for Vetiver is to set things up to make it easy to do the right thing, to, to, um, sup to uh, keep protect against common failure mode. So I, you know, when I talk to people who deploy models, this is actually one of the most common failure modes, is that the model gets put in production and new data comes in, and something actually changes about the new data. Maybe it's an error at some point, or maybe some other team did it on purpose, right? And the sort of best case scenario in that situation is that your model errors and you know what happened. <laughs> But that's not what happens. Sometimes models are very capable of just like chugging along and continuing to generate predictions when the input data is actually now entirely wrong. It is not unheard of for this to happen. That's kind of worst case scenario because your model is now generating nonsense, but you have no idea. We also have another really common sort of struggle that people have when it comes to deploying models, putting their models into production, is, is tr you know, tracking and then giving information to other teams about what, what exactly does my model need to generate new predictions? What are the, um, the dependencies, the software dependencies of the model? And making it um, easy to do the right thing is not just about, um, is not just about what, where did it go? There we go. No. Is not just about, um, uh, like what does it take to actually put the model into production, but also is about how do we document models. So in Vetiver, we have a, um, uh, a template for do, writing a model card for um, a model card, which is the idea is taken from this paper, model cards for model reporting. And it, um, it's a template. We have it available in either R or Python. And then it has all these uh, different um, sections here and some sections can be automated because we we know some things about the model like what kind of um, what kind of <clears throat> Um, metrics were used to tune it, what type of model it is. But some of the sec some of the like sections of this model reporting framework cannot be automated and it takes um, it takes input from you as a model developer. It takes it, it takes the process of you thinking and and writing things out. So we want to make it easy to do the right thing by um, providing both software, that does this right thing and also opportunities for, for documenting. Okay, so let's talk about these different tasks. So first we start with versioning. So much like you know, many of you probably have adopted version control practices for your code, we need to have some kind of approach for um, managing versioning of models. This, this starts to become important if you have, um, if you, the number of models you're dealing with grows and or you're retraining models um, um, frequently enough that you, you need some process that is the equivalent of moving from emailing files to your coworkers that say like underscore is final, underscore final to, you know, and to moving to Git. You need something that's like the, the, the analogy for that for models. So we need to manage change in models well. We need to deploy the model, right? Like we keep saying this. We keep, and in, in Vetiver, we adopt practices around using REST APIs for models. So there are different ways to deploy a model, to put a model into production. But the, um, the machine learning community, the MLOps community, has kind of identified that REST APIs are the good option for sort of that big middle. Like the big middle of models in production, the best option for you is a REST API. It maybe isn't, you know, like there of course are other ways to do this and if you are in a very simple situation or a high scale 
scale kind of situation. You may need something that's not a REST API, but certainly if you're getting started, this is where to go. And then MLOps is also about is monitoring. The other big category of task is monitoring the model once it is deployed and in production. So this is about is the model performing the way that you expected it to? Is, is it time to retrain the model with new data? And at what point does, do you need to find out whether it's appropriate to just start again from scratch with, from the whole model development process. Like, let's just start over. Um, we need to figure out what's going on and, and make basically a new model. So let's um, dig into these just a little bit more and show you some code for how you would do this. So when we version the model, uh, we, are, we use a, I don't know, a, I guess another metaphor or an abstraction um, that comes from pins, the pins package. So um, the, the metaphor here is that you have a board. Here I'm showing you a board that is, uh, uh, uses Posit Connect, which is one of Posit's pro products. But this, instead of pot Board Connect, this could say Board S3 for an S3 bucket. It could say um, Board Drive if you're using a network drive. So depending on what your organization uses for where you want to um, keep data, we, the, the idea is that the, um, the workflow is the same you just change out what the board is. And the, the metaphor here is like I come and I pin, I pin the model to my board. And so I say, okay, here it is. So think of pins as a fairly lightweight um, storage, versioning, um, sharing kind of, uh, kind of uh, system that is available here. If I retrain the model, the same model on different data, I can pin it also to the board, and then both versions are there. I can get to both versions, and um, if I need to, but like one is, is latest, right? So that one that's latest can be the default one that I get to. I'm just gonna show you um, what this looks like, so you can kind of see the, a bit about what the metadata that is stored there looks like. There. Okay, so this is on um, this is on our uh, Connect uh, demo um, demo server, and you know we have some you know we have things so that we can compare exactly the contents of what we have here. We we get automatically we get a lot of this um, information generated. So that is just very um, whoops. That is just very, so you know, the model is stored there um, with some metadata. Notice it was a binary blob. And again, if you're gonna have, use REST APIs, binary model objects are like, this, this is the easiest way to go for the vast majority of use cases. Once we have that, then we can create a REST API. So here's the code you would write to set up a REST API that's running locally, say, say on your laptop or whatever your development environment is. Um, one thing we notice when we talk to people who are trying to get started with MLOps is that many tools that are built out there for MLOps um, really uh, focus so much on the production environment that it's really hard to use it locally. And you have to use it locally because you have to debug problems and you have to, um, you have to set things up, you have to do dry runs. So we, um, as we thought about like what are the common problems that the people we're talking to have, we talked about how to make sure that people can have a local experience as they're developing, debugging, solving problems that feels very fluent um, moving from the local to, to actually the production. So if we were to run this, if I then like piped it to PR run, I like if you were using the RStudio IDE, it pops up in the window. If you like to use something like Visual Studio Code, it, um, it will give you the URL that then you would go and like paste it into a browser. And you can actually see what, um, what the sort of HTML interface to the REST API looks like. So, I, we, I'm like, okay, that sounds great, but I really, I want to actually deploy the model. Like, what, what do we talk about getting it into some new kind of computational environment? So when, so hey, let's, let's say, what does it mean to put something into production? I think the easiest way to think about it for me is that we develop a model in one computational environment. Think of this as maybe your laptop. Or maybe you work, you know, on a server environment, but it's it's one place, and it turns out the the um, the the software that you need to have installed there 
is about tuning, is about um, training. The putting something into production is getting it out of that computational environment, like lift it out and successfully carry it over to a new computational environment. Um, for, for many people, this might be like a cloud computing environment. It might be some kind of server that your organization has. We need to take it and lift it and then successfully have it working over here. So in Vetiver, we have two main approaches that we have for like, like how do you do this and where does this work? The first one is um, the pro products that Posit has. And here, it's literally one function because it is our own product, right? Like we can make sure this works really well. And this function actually deploys the model. Like after you run this, the model is literally, uh, there's literally a, an API on your server that will generate predictions. But Vetiver is open source software. It is not something that is only for Posit customers. Um, and so for, for um, moving in a different way, working in a different way, we uh, make it as easy as possible to generate a Docker container that can serve your model. So this function, notice it has a different verb. It says Vetiver prepare Docker. So what this function does is it generates a Docker file, um, an rn.lock file and an app file, like a, like a plumber file in this case, that is specially tailored to your model. You know, you don't want to be known as like the data scientist who makes enormous Docker containers when they don't need to be enormous, right? So this is specially tailored to include just the information that your model needs to run. So you get these files, these bundle of artifacts, then you can use Docker to build that. And then you have a container that can go wherever it needs to go. It can go, um, let, so let's say you use AWS. You can take that model, you can put it in an ECR registry, and then you can serve that, um, that Docker container um, in any of the like five ways that AWS <laughs> to serve um, Docker containers. Um, so one um, approach that we like to think of here is that for people who are at the beginning of their of their like model deployment or model MLOps journey that they have these options, some of which are um, super fluent. Like you know, Posits Pro products are really built for you know people from the data science persona, people who are like that's your your main toolkit. But we also have opportunities for people to go you know anywhere else that they need to with the, these models, and also. Um, that are the support for people growing, you know, like, like moving to bigger scale or whatever it is that we need to do there. So let me show you one of these, what one of these looks like. Um, is this. So this is the, I think, hopefully that's big enough. This is a, um, a model that is deployed on a on our our, our connect uh, demo server, and this is you may be thinking, oh, interesting! Like you're you're like clicking around here. Oh, I think it's waking back up. Like I'm clicking around here, but this is not really like a shiny app that is meant for a person to interact with. I mean, I guess I guess at some level, let me. There it goes. Okay, it had fallen asleep. Um, so this is not a. This is not something that's built most clearly for human users like a Shiny app. What this is is visual interactive documentation for the REST API. So I can go here to this get endpoint, which if you know, I, you know, it's fine if you don't know a lot about APIs. Think of it as like two computers are talking to each other, and I say, oh, I need to get something. Here, if I go to get pin URL, I get exactly the version, like exactly where the binary model, the versioned metadata, um, uh, metadata rich model object is that we can get to here. And you know, if I were to, this is where you know the really important stuff happens here. And notice that I I see like this is all self-documenting. Like this is all automatically created because of the information that you had about the model when you trained it. And I can I can actually interact with this. And the um, so the idea here is not that um, we whoops oh my gosh I'm not that familiar. <laughs> With Windows, um, okay. So the um, this is a. I am like so slow here. Okay, <laughs> so let's say that um, 
I, I, can, I can put in example data and get out a, um, a prediction. So this is a predicted price for this, and I can, let's see how fast I can do this. And let's say if it's a much bigger house, you know, um, so the, 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 per, whoops, the purpose of me showing this is not that this is like the absolute best way to interact for a person to interact with a model, but rather that this is how your model gets documented, uh, how, how, how to interact with your model. So say you're working with someone who is a software engineer collaborator, and you need to say to them, um, here is how you, you know, um, how you make an API call for, for my model of this API that I made. And this, you say, like, look, here's, here's exactly um, the curl commands that you would need to have to be able to interact and say, OK, let's make a request. Let's go, um, let's post some new data for new observations and then get back um, the, the response here. So th what this is about is um, being a good being a good collaborator, showing that you are the person that can take the model the last mile and get it into the hands of the people that need to interact with the, um, with the model. OK, so, so we talked about versioning. We talked about deploying, right? putting into production, lifting the model, getting it somewhere else. And now let's talk about monitoring. So Vetiver has in it um, uh, uh, functions and code to help you get set up with either, you know, and we can start with default metrics, but we can use custom metrics. And one thing that we have found when we talked to, um, to people who were working on monitoring problems is that monitoring problems often are very specific to, to people's um, uh, business problems. Like it's not uncommon for people want to monitor, monitor something that's not, you know, RMSE, but rather related to a KPI in their in their organization. And so what we what we do here is we well, this really highlights for us that a code first approach to model monitoring is is almost required. Like it's basically what we have to offer people. So there again is like a template in Vetiver that generates code for you based on your own model. But it is code. So then you take it and you just um, you just go with it. So if you've heard discussions, you know, lately about oh like how will LLMs make you faster? Like you start with something and then you can edit it. Like that's the kind of mental I mean there's no LLMs here to be clear but like that's the mental model right like it gives you it gives you code that is generated and it runs and it works and we you know show you things say oh um, here's if you have say that feedback loop where you get true values and you can compute some kind of statistical metric or maybe you don't and so what you monitor is just the input data like the um, the statistical properties of the predictors the input to the model and of course we want to be able to show this to you know to our coworkers so they know how these things work. But this is all code that is generated and that you have access to, so you can customize it in the way that is appropriate to your work. So using Vetiver is designed to <clears throat> be a good option for people who are just getting started with MLOps. So it is, it is designed with, with a user persona, top of mind, who is someone who has never deployed a model before, and we want to be able, them to be able to deploy their first model. So we want the barrier to entry to be low. We want the learning curve to start out low. At the same time, Vetiver is not meant to be um, a toy project or a, to or a tool only for beginners. We want to give, pe like, give people a tool Tool that has you know great defaults, easy for people to get started with. But when you have more complicated needs, whatever that might mean in your case, maybe high compliance needs, maybe it means high scale needs, maybe it means you have a lot of different tiny models. You know, depending on what is specific about your particular use case, we it's important to choose a tool that can. Um, 
that can scale with you, you and your org as it grows. So this is what Vetiver is built to do. And that, is, that makes it kind of unique compared to other um, MLOps tools that might be out there that might focus much more maybe on a high scale end. They might focus much more on a, um, on a, uh, like a, like a software engineer persona, thinking that's the person who is deploying the models. Whereas we, we really do think if you develop models, you can be the one to deploy the model and then your skill can grow as the needs, as the needs change. So um, I'll, I'll just remind us here, the things that Vetiver does is to version, deploy, and monitor. And this, this also makes Vetiver a little unique because a lot of these other tools sit in slightly different places. Sit, um, may, some of them may be more interested in being involved in the model training process, the mo like the model, like say hyperparameter tuning, and you can't actually deploy a model with some frameworks if you didn't use it to train your model. And, but a lot of people don't want to use the tool to train, you know, this that that tool, say, um, to train your model. So it is. Um, uh, it, this puts it kind of in a unique place. And the other thing I think that is unique about Vetiver is that um, Vetiver was built from the ground up for R and Python models. So there's an R package and a Python package. Um, a lot of the tools that are out there, um, you know, actually are like almost unusable for R, but um, because they are designed in the way that they were, they actually sometimes don't give a great experience for Python people as well. Also, I don't know what language we're going to be using in 10 years, 20 years, but the, the design choices that underlie Vetiver use technologies that I would be willing to bet are. You know, like we're talking things about how do we carefully think about smart blob storage, right? Pretty sure we'll still be doing that. Uh, I, I bet REST APIs will still be here, and, you know, in that long. Um, so what, um, and I think, you know, HTML and dashboards, right? Here to stay, here to stay. So I think that what Vetiver can, like, can be a good option to learn because it makes your skills um, uh, appropriate in many uses there. Um, so if you're interested, I know we, this is an R conference, and I pretty much, you know, I, I, run, I run Python code, but I don't, like, I don't write a lot of Python code. But if you are someone who maybe moves back and forth uh, a little bit between, this is one of our um, documentation sites that shows what are the functions that um, you use to do the same kinds of tasks in R and Python. It's been really interesting to work on a project where we want to focus on tasks and then make you know, support and functions for people to approach those tasks in ways that feel comfortable. We, we don't want to write a Python package that no Python people actually want to use, and same, because we have had that experience as our, as our user. So it's been really an interesting project to work on for that reason. So again, here's what MLOps is. I'll um, focus here on this idea of like you deploy and you maintain. And there's these things that you need to do in order to be able to get that in a good place with your model. And the last thing maybe is, maybe some of you are sitting here and you're like, well, this all sounds like totally disconnected from the work that I do. Maybe you're someone who does largely do data analysis or statistical analysis. Maybe you are someone who, you know, spends all your time writing sh shiny apps, and you think like, what, like, why should I care at all about ML ops um, or or what it is? So I think the first reason why it would be smart for you to learn a little bit about um, ML ops and what it is would be how do you how do you um, learn how that your work can be, can be lifted and moved? Like, can you start to build some of those muscles about what does it mean to put your work um, into production, to, to deploy your work? And the other thing is that it does, when you, are, when you are the one who can take your work the last mile, then that's how you can really scale the impact of your work in your, <clears throat> your organization. So I'm going to put, uh, you probably have seen this URL here at the bottom, but you can use, you, um, the slides are available at that URL here. And you can come and see, you know, learn more in these sort of recommended resources. So feel free to go there and click through the, those. And with that, I will, um, oh yeah, one more, there you go. And with that, I will, uh, I will say thank you for having me. Thank you so much. And I think maybe we have some time for questions.